Stephen Thomas. I'm the director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity in the School of Public Health at the University of Maryland in College Park. And we're here at the Woolly Mammoth for a live professional reading of the Barbershop Storybook. I think we're onto something. You know what I think we're onto? I think we're on our way to Broadway. What's up, everybody? What's up? Uh, my name is Marcus Ford, and it's Jasmine Mitchell, and we are the two artistic leads of what we call the Barbershop Storybook Project. Yeah. yeah, we are so delighted to be here at Woolly Mammoth Theater in the rehearsal hall, repping Woolly. So. Jasmine, <laughs> I mean, this theater means a lot to me, so I'm just so excited to be performing in this space specifically. So thank you to all the folks who helped make this space happen and set it up. Um, but the Barbershop Storybook Project is an arts initiative by the University of Maryland School of Public Health and Maryland Center for Health Equity. And that's led by Dr. Stephen B. Thomas, who is joining us. Stephen Thomas, who we fondly call Dr. T. He's so enthusiastic about the arts. He's so passionate about making this information accessible and using art as a medium to do that. So he has this, like, for any theater people who know that yes and mentality. Like, we have an idea, and he's like, okay, but think bigger. Like, what's Always the biggest thing? Always not thinking bigger. You know? <laughs> um, so that's just so encouraging to have in someone who's leading a project, not, oh, well, we don't have the funding for it. He's always trying to connect the resources to us as the artists, and that just means so much. So, yeah. Give these guys a hand. <laughs> you know, they say we can't connect to young people. I do not agree. Sometimes the pandemic. Has a silver the lining. Way. Silver lining. Earlier today, we actually did a TV commercial with the Baltimore Ravens, and they signed the book. They signed the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He said, "Jackson, can you believe that?" So I think this is a blessing here tonight. Let's on with the show. <laughs> into our presentation to give some more context about what this project is. As I said, this is an arts initiative by the Maryland Center for Health Equity and the University of Maryland School of Public Health, and it's made possible by um, Cigna, our sponsor. Um, <laughs> oh, Sherry, yes. Yeah. from somewhere in Oh, I grew up from New Jersey. <laughs> but no, I just want to say what an honor and a privilege it is to be here today. I actually, I came down to be in Baltimore for this filming of this NFL commercial to really highlight what we're doing in the barber shops. It is amazing work, and I, I got to see firsthand. We have a, a hairstylist who's with us today. Raise your hand. was in the same timing of this this evening, and so I'm glad to be here to be with you all and see this tonight, so thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna jump right into the background and how we got to this point today. We've been working with the University of Maryland since last November to develop the first two books and onward for a group of seven books. Um, they all take place in BG County, I mean, actually, I mean, we kind of have a script, so maybe I shouldn't go off script. No, go ahead. Okay. Speak from the heart. Speak from the heart. So, <laughs> with this project, right, we really trying to, I'm joking. So we have, um, <laughs> this is an arts initiative by the University of Maryland Center for Health Equity, and what we're trying to do is give good, reliable information with authentic characters and with people who look like us 
and who are like, you know, everyday people, right? So if you look around the room, you have barbers, you have stylists, you have educators, you have people who are studying, you have pharmaceutical people, you have church members, you have just about everyone. And that is what the Barbershop Story with Project is about. We are trying to champion, really there is no small voice. They're all voices and as artists we listen and we're researchers too in a way. Uh, and now we're gonna, you know, we're gonna talk about the research, I guess. Yeah, so there is a 30 page community facts report that we dove into last December, um, talking about how COVID really exacerbated or made worse the existing health disparities for the black community. So COVID was its own issue, yes, but there's also already an existing disconnect between the black community and the medical institution. There's this long history of distrust of the medical institution um, when folks saw the vaccine rollout come so quickly, folks were like, uh, I don't know, this is too quick, and um, would reference the Tuskegee experiment as a reason why they didn't want to trust that. Um, and what else? There was the technology barrier, there's a language barrier, there was the confusion and messaging. So we got all of that from this Communivax report um, that the, it was UMD School of Public Health put out. Yeah. Um, and from that, we distilled it to seven different six different storylines um, representing now, different now, people. More for now, for now. Um, <laughs> just showing how there is, how it affects different people groups. So for instance, for elderly folks who have trouble navigating um, technology, there there is one person who said that the cheat to that was having a young person who knew how to work um, right. technology to schedule your vaccine appointment for you. Um, so just knowing that there's these different type of barriers depending on the demographic we wanted to highlight that in each of the books. So for instance, in books one and two, which you'll hear tonight, um, book one, we have Antoine who lost his job during the pandemic. He's feeling hesitant about the vaccine. And so he's unable to get a job. This is fall of 2021. Um, and he's kicking in with his sister Sharice, but she's kind of up to here with him. Um, and so we have a conversation between Antoine and his nephew as they walk to school about why Sharice is being hard on him. Then book two, we have children's mental health um, because little Danny, she's feeling anxious. Uh, a little boy in her class is teasing her and saying uh, that, well, I will leave that for the reading. I don't right. want to spoil it all. all right. But um, we see a young child who's struggling with anxiety. So we have that larger conversation of how COVID is making it hard for children to succeed in school. There's a lot of unhad conversations and we're trying to bring that to life. And not only is the book about vaccine confidence, but really people don't talk about vaccines and medicine anymore. I feel like <clears throat> a lot of us just like are in the mood to talk about people who have been shut out from those conversations feel like they've been talked down to for so long that we want to be a bridge and not tell you what to do or when to do it, but give you the information to make choices on your own. Uh, we think that the black community has faced a lot of medical racism. Um, so what we want to do is, you know, like treat them like the intelligent community that we are um, and not baby down information, but give them information that they can, you know, hold and settle and make decisions for themselves. Um, so for the community that's report, this 32 page document, you know, when they sent it, I was like, 32 pages, anybody trying to read that? But I read it, but I read it. And it was actually really good. It was really good. And it was actually like stories. So you have about 20 people in the community that's report who all give their experiences of what they went through with the pandemic. So you have children who were doing homework at the kitchen table with four other people while they're watching TV. You have um, you know, like people moving into very um, like family situations that were crowded. So you have people spending more time with each other. And that led to you know, situations of domestic violence and all these other issues that born out of that. What Jasmine was saying about the vaccine access. For PG County, you had vaccines and you had people from Montgomery County and surrounding areas come and claim the vaccines that were meant for black people. So you have all of these disparities, and you know, you happen in Waldorf. Jasmine, you know, Jasmine knows Waldorf. I don't know. <laughs> but you had the <laughs> <laughs> but you had the vaccine was like in Waldorf, and you had it in six flags, and you had it like during working hours. And these were not made for the average working person to have. So what we're trying to do is right those wrongs. And I think that 
this project is the first step in doing that. It's like a bridge. It's like a bridge, yeah. um, bridging the gap. So yeah, so we are pretty much the trying to air in the solution to those problems. So for this one, with this project, with book two, it takes place at my old elementary school, Thomas Stone. And my second grade teacher helped me write it. And she was on the board. like, And we had talks with the barbers and stylists. And pretty much like we would write a script. Uh, then we would read it to the people. And they'd be like, nah, you know, I'm not, it's not really hitting it like that for real. <laughs> and they're like, well, we'll rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. So the feedback loop never closed. Um, and that's what we think is important, having this room again. Um, but like, that's what this project is. It's just everyone there at the same time. All voices matter. You sit beside, like, look at your neighbor. Everybody, look at your neighbor. 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 Greet a friend. Greet a friend. Say amen. Make your new friend. Make your new friend. Come on. But our project is to people along the stuff of every single way. And that's why we decided to have such a diverse group of people here. So right here, we have a serious layout, which, Jasmine, where, where, wait, where's my screen? Talk to What's on the screen? Yeah, so we have book one, the Jackson, book I mentioned, Anton, lost and got for the pandemic, example with the sister Charisse. Um, we have book two, which is called Mrs. Castillo, Counselor Castillo, um, who is comforting little Danny, who's experiencing anxiety. And you're getting a sneak peek of future books over here, so pay close attention. Book three is the convenience store. We have Angel, um, who's homeless or a person without a home. Antoine encounters him on his walk back home. Um, so we really want to take this opportunity to, to discuss um, how folks without homes are navigating the pandemic. I think that's a that's a perspective we don't get to hear as much. Um, book four, just checking in. We have um, Earl, who is seven, in his seventies, and he lost his friend during the pandemic. So discussing themes of grief and loss. His uh, lost friend's son, who's a pastor, comes by with groceries and they start a conversation about the booster shot. Book five, working mom. Um, we have a nurse uh, who recently got COVID and she's in quarantine, and her boyfriend, who has to work even through, um, work through having COVID as well. He's like, I'm just going to keep my mask in, but a mask on, but I need to go into work to keep the bills. Okay. And then book six, it all comes together at the barber shop in book number six. Hence the title. Hence the title. <laughs> um, and just to talk about that a little bit, um, barbers and salons, they're barbers and salonists, they're the folks who see people week to week so they can continue a conversation, even if someone's vaccine hesitant, um, continue to move that needle forward bit by bit. Um, so recognizing barbers and salons can be a place where we can disseminate this information and make it accessible. Um, so that's what book six is. Um, and we see Antoine's journey throughout all of these books from vaccine hesitant, pushing the needle forward. And like Marcus said, not, not preaching the vaccine as the solution to all the issues, but um, it's certainly a step forward. Um, so that's what we discuss in, in book six. Yeah, so yeah. all of these problems are based on research done at UMD from that document. We're just like, there's no way we can write one book with all this information. So we expanded it into a whole series. All of that takes place in PG County and Brentwood, Hyattsville. Um, you have like full young carryout to see that. Um, and we really think that we are on some of this model and we look forward to expanding it even further. Here are the plot lines, like we stated, you have unemployment, vaccine hesitancy, Family boundaries, everyone knows we need those. Um, not a play to one of my parents and my brother who are in the audience, but everyone else who isn't here in the family. Um, we have like Sturgis Mental Health. Um, the convenience store one is about Angel who has to use the restroom, but he doesn't have money to pay for a good. So we're, you know, it's like, huh, I never thought about how people without homes did not have public restrooms during the pandemic. So we're just like showing all of these ways that inequality is just in America and they're in all neighborhoods. And we think that we're on the song, that I think. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna keep the show, keep the party 
going. Uh, and look into the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the one who studied theater, but Marcus is the more dramatic one. <laughs> I've, I've watched a lot of uh, Sesame Street and uh, stuff like that. But, That's true. I mean, uh, wait, that the right reference to me? Yeah, I mean, we're making puppets. We are making puppets. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, was, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. I like that. We have puppetry in the future. We have books in the future. We have readings like this. We're going to do a stage production soon, I'm sure. Yes. Um, what else are we doing? We have musical compositions. We have merch. We have merch. podcasts. We have, podcasts. Yeah. we have a team of 14 black and brown people behind this project, very talented from the area. Uh, and we are using UMD's money, save this money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, and we are, we get to pay artists, which is great, and yeah. these are really talented artists. We have Nabil here on camera. We have Elaine Tamara on camera. We have Isanda Sa over there on, on as a producer. We have Jason McKenzie. We have all those actors in the back. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, yeah, this oh, wait, project. No, no, no. With the interpreter. We have our BSL interpreters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so BASL means that, you know, how we have AAVE. They also have their sign language. Yeah. So this is not the, you know, the King's English sign language. <laughs> we have the, the black vernacular, and we have that here today. So we're all about accessibility with oh, wow. this project. We have closed captions with our videos. Yeah. We have signers. And we are just trying to give the people information, however they have it. Short films, podcasts, whatever we have to do to right these wrongs. Come on now. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I think that we are about ready okay. for our books one and two reading. So what you're about to hear is book one, which takes place with um, as Tarek is Antoine and Sharice who live together. They have a little disagreement and you have uh, their nephew, or rather Antoine's nephew, Anthony, he walks from the school. And in book two, you have it comes from Justino, which deals with children's society. Um, for this reading, you know, I mean, like if you feel like laughing, laugh. Um, if you feel like, hmm, why do you say that? You know, like, say, like verbalize, you're here too. I don't believe that audience have to be quiet. We want this to be fun. Uh, we are a barbershop story with project. And Katrina, you can probably co-sign that barbershops are not quiet. So long for not quiet. So let's have that energy. Yeah, so you're like, why do you yeah, say that? He's tripping. Some she is tripping. Yeah. Oh, what? Amen. For, you know, like whatever you want to do. Um, have fun. Uh -huh. We're having fun. We're having fun. Thank and you. Thank you. So it's all for you. The Barbershop Story Book Project Books 1 and 2. Okay. Book 1. Our story begins at Sharice's apartment in the early morning around 6 a.m. The sun is gently easing in the day. Antoine, age 28, is already standing in the kitchen, bent over, looking in the refrigerator with headphones in. He wears a white tank top and gray sweatpants looking rough. He begins to make a fruit smoothie using the blender, and let me tell you, it is not quiet. He does push-ups while the smoothie disrupts the peace. His older sister, Sharice, age 34, enters the kitchen, already dressed for work. She looks down on Antoine, who is on his 18th push-up, and shakes her head before taking the bacon, eggs, and bagels out the fridge. Antoine finally gets up and takes out his headphones. Sharice reaches for a bowl and doesn't bother turning around. Whew! Mom. Good morning. You making that turkey bacon right now? He just knows he's getting some. Sharice begins making eggs and puts the bacon in the microwave. 
She presses the add 30 seconds button three times. Yes, me and my son <laughs> will be eating turkey bacon, yes. Come on, Reese. You can't make me in. You know I'm hungry. We fine. Boy, you are not eating up my fridge. You follow up with me, see about that job? See, you always focus on the wrong things. I did, it's not for me. They require a vaccine. Antoine pours his smoothie into a cup and takes a sip. He has a milk mustache. Yeah, <laughs> so? It means I'm still looking. Swan, look, you gotta take the job. I can't float you forever, just get the vaccine. I don't know. <laughs> I'll think about it. Just give me two more weeks to see. Two more weeks? <laughs> You said that four weeks ago. <laughs> you know what? I'm glad you could count. The smoothie misses Antoine's mouth. Some of it gets on his sweatpants. Dang, man. Playing with you? I like these crimes. All right, you know what? I'm not having this. You don't want to get the vaccine? Absolutely no problem. But there are going to be rules then. Rules? The microwave beeps. It reads, and. Rules. I'm not having it in my house. You pose a risk to me and my son. You know what? I want you to know, I want to know who you're around and when you're around them. And you drink from a special cup with a special fork. Cherise takes Antoine's cup. She draws a skeleton and writes, biohazard, do not use. Morning with the marker. Whatever, you bugging. I'm grown, I don't need none of this. Yo, aunt, you ready? I'm gonna take you to school. Your mom stay tweet. Yeah, I'm ready, but I just need help with my belt. He hasn't eaten breakfast. Messing with you, I ain't even made his sandwich yet. Don't put your problems on me. Wrap it up, he'll take it to go. I'll help him with the belt. Anthony, age eight, appears dressed in school uniform with his belt in hand. Antoine gets low and helps with the belt. I tried, I just, I, I can't, I can't do it. It's all right, I'm got you. I'm acting like your sister. Your mom, I mean. Can't be too hard. <laughs> Antoine struggles with the belt. Let's see, I almost got it, I almost got it. Anthony still has his belt undone. Antoine looks confused as if it's a mad test. Cherise intervenes to help with the belt. Boy, move! Makes no sense. You want something done right, you always gotta do it yourself. All right, there you go, baby. Looking good, huh? Your sandwich is on the counter. And make sure you keep your mask on, okay? Anthony grabs his sandwich on the counter. Antoine grabs bacon off of a plate. Antoine! I know you did not just touch my bacon! Antoine mocks his sisters and continues to munch loud. Antoine and Cherise have a face off. They could both use a break from one another. Antoine! That was some good bacon. All right, let's bounce. Antoine and Anthony walk out of Cherise's apartment and down the apartment hallway, having just closed the door. You want to say you can't do what you say. <laughs> I heard that. Don't be talking about me behind my back. Her yell echoes through the hallway and Cherise's apartment door jumps from the noise. Antoine and Anthony snicker, then run down the hall. Back in Cherise's kitchen, we see her laugh to herself while doing dishes. Child, anyways. Outside the apartment complex, Antoine folds over to catch his breath. He sweats. There's a panel of his lungs screaming, Overdrive! Alert! Alert! Ant, who was once laughing, now looks a little concerned. Are you, are you okay? Man, you gotta hold up. He takes out his inhaler and restores his lung capacity as if he were in a video game. They begin walking to school. Make sure you eat that bagel before, you, before it gets home. I'm not that hungry, I promise. You trip. I'll eat it if you don't. I'll tell your mom. Anthony gives Antoine the bait. He begins to munch almost immediately. Mmm, that's a tasty bread. You know my mom loves you, right? What? Come on. Yeah, I know that. I love her too. Gets on my nerves. Reminds me of your grandma at times. Mm -hmm. She will always say, Antoine, you better come up and do these dishes. I'm gonna do these dishes. <laughs> Antoine, you're giving me ulcers. I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> Antoine this, Antoine that. 
But you know that's fine. Really know how to push your buttons. Colorful buttons appear on Anthony's shirt. And Antoine pokes them. Anthony laughs. They walk past full young Cariel. I mean, yeah, they can. They are intense. But it's only because they care. I miss her. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I do too. See, my thing is, I just don't like to be told what to do. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> what you mean you don't like to be told what to do? You better do what them teachers tell you to do and what I say do. I am, I promise. They arrive at the stop sign just before the crosswalk leading to the school. All right, now let me find out. Dang, I sound like your mama now, huh? Yeah. A crossing guard blows her whistle the whole track. Antoine and Anthony hold hands and walk alongside other kids, parents, and caretakers towards the schoolyard. The ants arrive near the entrance Thomas S. Stone Elementary School. Still standing side by side, Anthony looks up at Antoine. Uncle Ant? Yeah. I like having you around. You're so funny and I, I love our walks together. Antoine gets down and rests his hand on Anthony's shoulder. See, I don't know what you're trying to pull, but I ain't with all that sentimental stuff before school. <laughs> I wasn't really trying to do none of that. But I love you too, Ant. Oh, on the head. I'll see you later, right? They hug and Anthony runs into the school. Inside the school hallway, there's a sea of children walking. Counselor Miss Castillo, age 32, stands in the lobby area, area greeting students. Morning. Good morning, Anthony. Another male parent stands in the school entrance doorway next to Antoine as they watch the kids enter. That one yours? We see Anthony turn back to wave at Antoine. Antoine waves back at Anthony. Yeah, that's me. His phone buzzes. It reads, Barbara appointment, one hour. We also see he's playing music now. Antoine leaves and walks across the street as the crossing guard holds traffic. End of book one. <laughs> book two. Back in the school hallway, Miss Castillo, the school guidance counselor, stands down in her yellow dress, wedges, and a mask to match. A herd of students make their way to class in the background. Anthony dissolves into the sea of students. Good morning, students. Have a terrific Tuesday. All right, Tao, make sure to head to breakfast so you can get to class on time. Miss Moorefield, early 40s, helps her daughter Daniela, eight, exit the car. They walk from the parking lot and towards the school. All right, baby. You got everything, right? Yeah. Okay, don't drag your feet because we're already late. Come on. I'm not. Danny and Miss Moorefield rush into the school and approach Miss Castillo. Hi, Miss Castillo? It's, it's Castillo, right? Uh, Castillo, but yes. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, you must be Mrs. Moorefield. Letitia. Oh, so nice to meet you, Miss Letitia. Mm -hmm. Sorry to be late. Oh, no worries at all. Miss Moorefield's phone rings. She silences it and begins to text while talking. Um, so look, this, this won't be long, right? We just going over some things? Um, uh, yeah, uh, sure. I think we can make it quick. Let's just head over to my office. It's right this way. The Moorefields follow Miss Castillo down the hallway and enter her office. Miss Castillo greets children as they navigate the busy hallways. Hey, Promise. Hola, Enrique. At the same time, Daniela makes eye contact with mischievous Mark, a kid who should be in line for home. He holds a toy and poses like a big, towering monster to scare her. He laughs and walks away. The teacher scolds him. Mark, put that toy away in the class for a late. I'm sorry for my voice. I didn't mean to, Mark. <laughs> the adults don't notice Daniela's being teased. She looks frightened and begins to walk faster. As they walk together, the crowd of students vanishes. The bell for home, ring, for home room rings, and Daniela covers her ears. Miss Moorefield comforts Daniela with a soft touch. It's OK, baby. It's OK. It's going to be all right. How are you, 
forward to this morning? Enjoying the crisp fall air? Yeah, I mean, we're all right. Just a busy morning, as usual. Oh, I know that all too well. I don't like the fall. No? You don't like seeing the leaves change colors, or the warm and fuzzy sweaters, or the cuddly blankets, or the pumpkins, and the peppermint? Yeah. Like they arrive in Miss Castillo's office. I don't like the crunch underneath my feet. And I hate winter. Fall is like winter's cousin, and I don't like it. Well, that's a shame. Sounds like you enjoy summer more than. Oh, I wish it was summer all the time. No school, and it's warm, and Mommy and I go on road trips. Sometimes I even go to the pool. Ah, uh, well, you can't beat that. <laughs> but I guess I'm biased. I like the fall, because then we get to start a new school year, and I get to see you. Come on in. Daniela and her mom enter the office and take a seat at the table in the center of the room. Miss Castillo closes the door and then makes her way to sit beside Daniela. Miss Moorefield's phone rings. Danny squints her eyes and covers her ears. You okay? Okay, um, the reason I have called this meeting is because... I'm sorry, look, I'm sorry. My phone is buzzing, um, it's work. I actually thought I had silenced it, but... It's okay, no need to apologize. Miss Morfield silences the phone and begins typing a text message. I don't want to take too much of your time, so I'll just get straight to the point. Miss Morfield finishes the text and puts her phone down. Almost immediately after it vibrates, she picks it up and begins to text again. So, um, Mrs. Morfield, we are halfway through the first quarter, and I have noticed that Daniela's grades have been slipping. Whoa, whoa. Slipping? What? I mean, why is this the first time I'm hearing of this? And that's why I'd like for us to talk about it. I'm hoping we can turn things around before it's too late. Daniela just looks down at the table, furrowing her brow. She's reminded of Mark teasing her, and her anxiety sets in. Danny, baby, what's going on? Daniela shrugs her shoulders. Miss Moorefield's phone rings again. Frustrated, Miss Moorefield picks the phone up, puts it on Do Not Disturb, and then continues. That's not an answer, Danny, okay? I'm gonna need you to use your words. Nothing, I, I don't know. That's it, that's it, okay. Since you don't know, how about I know? No more TV during the week, no more tablet, no more screen time. Do you know now? What, but I, I didn't, I, I didn't no. mean to, mom, I'm that's trying. it, okay? The TV is clearly too distracting. But I didn't do anything. Exactly, exactly, Danny. It is because you are not doing anything that your grades are low. But Mrs. Morefield. What? Look, okay, I just asked her yesterday about homework. I did. She said no. That means she lied. Did you lie? Daniela is beside herself. Danny. Danny fidgets her fingers before her mother's voice snaps. Her what eyes. is going on with you? Daniela. Your teachers report that you seem to be distant during your classes, distracted. Miss Moorefield, I mean, have you noticed any sort of weird behavior at home? Look, okay, honestly, that doesn't sound like my name. So, no, I, I don't know. She usually is very well engaged. A very vibrant Daniela, yes. And that seems that we're just not getting that right now at school. Daniela, is there something inside that you want to talk about to us? I just, no. I... Daniela begins to cry. Miss Moorefield's expression softens, and Miss Castillo places a hand on Danny's shoulder. Oh, sweetheart. I mean, tell us what's the matter. Take your time. No, breathe. Okay, you can really tell us what's going on. When, when, when I was on, on the playground the, the, last week, I, I talked about how, how I got the shot. You mean the vaccine? Mm-hmm. Then, then Mark, 
He took my toy and t told me that I was too late. It, it didn't matter because the news says we're all going to die from COVID. Then he pushed me on the ground. Mark laughs and teases as a cartoonized COVID monster emerges in the sky. Like Mark, it towers over Daniela with its arms ready to come down on her. And he said that the COVID monster is a super evil villain and, and that's going to kill our, our family. And I don't want mommy to die. Oh, baby, why, why didn't you just tell me all of this? Look, it's okay. Miss Moorefield moves in closer to comfort Dan. Oh, Danny, I'm so sorry. I mean, that's just not true at all. We are not gonna die from COVID, okay? But I do agree with Mark on one thing. COVID, the ugly, nasty, fail COVID, this super even villain monster thing, we should be aware of it. We, we should? Yes. But if COVID is the villain, then you know what? What? <laughs> then that makes Vaccine the superhero! Do -do -do -do. I mean, imagine this. The Vaccine flies in and says, have no fear, the Vaccine is here. Miss, uh -oh. <laughs> Miss Castillo does a Superman gesture. Daniela smiles a bit, the sadness in her eyes slowly lifting. Superhero dream sequence! <laughs> Daniela sees vaccine hero flying in the sky. COVID monster is struck with fear, reveling, reeling back its ugly head. And his sidekick masks, they fight right near, they're right here helping here too. Mm -hmm. They fight the bad guys in our bodies. In our bodies? Yes. And the air filters suck the virus out of the air. They work together to fight the bad guys who make us sick. So. Even if COVID gets a little too close, vaccine and masks double team. Pow, pow, pow! To keep you and the others safe. Wow, do you kind of see it now? I think so. The vaccine in our bodies is like the coat I wear in the winter, so I don't feel as cold. That is an excellent metaphor, sweetie. I agree. <laughs> And as for Mark, remember when Miss Fultz came and talked about bullying? Well, this is something that I will be having a talk with him and his parents. You don't have to keep things to yourself. Sometimes feelings are big and that's okay. That's what we're here for. Me and your mommy want you to feel comfortable sharing with us. Okay? I just felt so scared. I mean, I feel scared too, Danny. Sometimes I do. What? You, mommy? No way. I mean, it's true. But you know what? In those moments, I take a deep breath and I take stock of what's in front of me. I have so, so much to be grateful for. For our house, food, life, and for you, sweetie. <laughs> There's a lot we don't know about the future, but I'm ready to take it on with you by my side. I'm grateful for you too, Mark. They hug. <laughs> so, if the vaccine is a superhero and it's inside us, doesn't that make us super too? Absolutely it does. Superhero dream sequence. Daniela, Miss Moorefield, and Miss Castillo stand side by side, ready to take on the COVID monster. The vaccinated trio saves the day. And to celebrate, ice cream and a road trip to grandma's. <laughs> End of book two. <laughs> Uh, 
um, you all can, well, we're going to do a talk back, right? Marcus, what should we talk We about? are. I think yeah. that we should know who these actors are. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. So their names are on the program, but so also let's introduce them. So we have Selena, we have Jason, Lorenzo, Nina, Donita, and Jamie. We have Duran and Cynthia. And to, um, I know you have some reflection questions. Some reflection questions. We like for this to be a two-sided engagement. So, you know, we're going to have everyone talk and feel free to say how you felt. Uh, what is it driving pops, wonders? Pops and wonders. So things that stood out to you, um, that made a reaction towards, and anything you have to say about what you saw on Yeah. So what pops, what do you wonder, and what happened? We had unlimited resources. <laughs> uh, just a couple of observations. I just love the research that the artists went through to make this real. They spent time in the barbershops. They read the research reports. I want to introduce Dr. Sandra Quinn. Stand up, Dr. Quinn. She keeps the wheels on this ship moving forward, all right? So, and the chief investigator to the community acts. What do you think? Translating the science into what you just saw tonight. You know, every week I hear, well, not every week, probably every day I hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> but seeing the actors and means it comes alive. And there's so, you know, the pandemic at times felt so big and everything felt so, and there's, insurmountable and what they captured were really the feelings and the human side of what has been happening to us here's one lady that knows for sure who is one of our stylists who's been on the front lines yes I enjoyed the storytelling. I think it was a good way to exhibit um, real life and family through storytelling. I think it was really, really nice. And I like the fact that it's relatable to all ages. I thought that was pretty good. So y'all did a great job. Keep up the great work. Thank you, Katrina. <laughs> Uh, and they did a live reading, just like spontaneous, right in the barbershop. Mm -hmm. And somebody had come into the barbershop just to get a haircut. And they said, you know, would you mind reading the part of Antoine? And he said, yeah, I'll read it. And now he's on the stage. <laughs> 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 Real quick for you, sit in the barbershop, read, and now here you are putting a heartbeat on that Antoine. What was right. that like for you? All right, y'all. So y'all don't got to call me Antoine. Y'all can just call me Twan. Let's inform me. Feel my uncle with them. Uh, and I guess I was just in there. Came from moving. They were doing their thing. And I was just trying to mind my business, as I do at an elite level. <laughs> and he was like, we need somebody to read. And who better than me, right? So they asked me. I did it. And I guess they thought I was good. <laughs> now I'm in. I mean, what did we think, boys? Did you <laughs> Well, it's your job, or what? And just one more piece, because this work comes out of uh, uh, research that was funded by the National Institutes of Health, the first barbershop work we get in Pittsburgh. And we brought it here to Maryland, and it's coming out to this part. Cigna's been with us the whole way. I want you to know what the long-term investment looks like. So we literally have our project officer from the National Institutes of Health, He's now retired, Dr. Derek Tabor. Come on up, Dr. Tabor. Come on. So Dr. Tabor, you know, the fight you had to make the science of what we've done and now see it go this far, the pandemic really brought it out in the open, why this is so important, hyper-local engagement. I gotta know, what pop for you, my friend? First of all, these words are my own and have nothing to do with your age. <laughs> what pops for me is the youth. 
It's just the fact that we have all these young people up here telling the story that hopefully will translate to people getting shots in the arm. So that's what pops for me. I did have one question. Did I hear Superman or Superwoman? <laughs> Superwoman? <laughs> I heard superhero. I think, I think that's really true. I really like it. Now, throughout the books, uh, even when you had the scene about the belt and you saw like, a math problem, that's real calculus. So throughout the book, <laughs> we sprinkled STEM themes. And when the kids find those STEM themes uh, on the interactive website, they would get like a prize and, and something that you could discover along the way. And of course, Marcus with the whole gamification strategy in the books. So that it's very, very important that we are able to do that. And those boxes they talked about, those Corsi boxes are literally here in this room, circulating the air, taking COVID, any other metals out of the air. And these were built by undergrads at the University of Maryland and then decorated by middle school students in their science class. Sherry, that kind of coming together brings us back as a community. Gives people something to do and it keeps the conversation going. Right. There are two other people who, who are critical to making this Communrex project work. So Meg Jordan. Come on, Meg. Meg. Come on, Meg. So these are staff in our Center for Health Equity that have shepherded this project. Maggie was on, on point. Meg's, Meg's our conductor. <laughs> So we'll start with you, Matt. What popped? You can pick a pop, sure. A wonder, or oh, what if? We had unlimited lease miles. Marcus, I just really appreciate uh, for the Communivex project. I was the interviewer for most of the interviews, um, so I got their stories, and I like. I don't know. That was really important to me, and I wondered when we wrote this, who would read it, um, because everybody had such a unique moment, and I just I really appreciate that you made people remember those moments, like all of them, you know? Uh -huh. And I just, it means a lot to me. So. Really yeah, yeah, I think that, I think that what we're doing with medicine and art, they're more related than they seem. Yeah. Uh, as researchers, me and Jasmine, we listen to people, we take those stories, we go back to the drawing board, we test them out in situations like this, we go to barber shops, churches, listen to how people react to it, and then we start again. And the similar thing happens in the medicine offices, the doctors. I think what I'm trying to say is that I think we're more alike than we realize. Yep. And I think that we're all trying to create a better future together in whichever way that we can. So I really appreciate for everyone coming here today. It is not lost on me that it is raining outside, that the weather is muggy, that it's hot and it's cold and it's wet and it's dewy, and I never used that we're doing it for. One more point, Marcus. Oh, wait, 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 wait really yeah, quickly, really quickly. Really I just really appreciate that everyone spent their night with us, um, and and DC and traffic and garage fees and all of that. It's not lost on me. Thank you. you know, a project to follow throughout this art. And that was Maggie, who has shepherded this through all this process with all the back office administrative, the reports that we send the signal. That's Maggie Davis. Hey, Maggie. Hey, Maggie. Yeah. All right, Maggie. What talk? What do you wonder? Or what if? We have a little bit of resources. Yeah, I think it's just been amazing to see this whole process, see it through all the iterations, and seeing it here with all the energy that it has delivered with. I absolutely loved it. Um, and just continuing to see how you make it better and better every time. I've like loved the little surprises every time. Um, so yeah, and I really appreciate all of the work you guys have done Thank so you. far, putting Thank into you. it, and you know, using the research and all of that. So. Thank you. Thank you. Now, yeah, I know you. I'm going to be quiet. Okay, okay. But we got parents in here. Marcus's mom, stand up, mom. Come on. And uh, uh, have I missed anything? No, I think you hit everything. <laughs> Do you want to give signal moment? Come on up and share the moments. Come on. Oh, I guess. <laughs>
I was thinking to myself that the president of Sigma Foundation, Susan Stiff, and I said this to my friend Lainey. This is my best friend Lainey, by the way, from high school. Awesome. She happens to live in D.C. And um, I said, you must come with me because she's actually involved in, in this type of work in the community. And so I'm so glad that she can be here. But I turned to her and I said that uh, the president of the Signet Foundation would probably be sitting, Not I know she would be sitting in the back with tears in her eyes. I absolutely oh. know that she would be Amazing. crying to see this. Mm -hmm. For me, the big pop is uh, the accessibility. I am thrilled to death to see the interpreters. Uh, <laughs> one of my roles at Signa, I'm on the leadership team of our um, enterprise resource group for people with disabilities. And um, I recently just had the opportunity to speak with Judy Human, who is yeah. amazing, yeah, one of yeah. the, the, the leaders of the exactly. disability rights movement. And we were talking about um, closed captioning versus signing, and she said both. She said, always if you could do both, do mm -hmm. both. Mm -hmm. um, so beautiful that you're doing this, because I can only imagine also that with people who have disabilities, the challenges that they must have been facing during the pandemic yeah. would be on a whole other level. And so to make this accessible to everybody is really just great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Then now we just want to take some time to hear from all of you. Um, so, you know, it's very, the floor is open. Um, you can sit down, you can stand up, you can come up here, whatever you want. Um, but yeah, we just want to hear from you all. Start with my mom. <laughs> Oh, oh. Oh. I'm proud of all of y'all. What's that Thank about? You. Come on. I'm proud of all of y'all. It's just the emotional evening. You know, we could be doing all kinds of things, but the market is supposed to talk about this part yet. Last November, I did not know how busy him and Jasmine were. <laughs> so when he put me turn my car, I said, why do you call me that? I'm busy, I'm busy. I said, okay, fine. So then when they get a presentation in June, I realized how much, how much they were doing. So I didn't interrupt them no more after June, from June to now. I'm just so impressed with all the um, friends that Marcus and Jasmine had gathered together to do this, who made time to present and and to inspire and to inform mm -hmm. about COVID and put it through um, comic form so everybody can receive it. And I'm just so thankful, Dr. T and all the staff. Yeah. After all the invite, I can't make nobody come. I always, I told all my buddies, you all need to come out and support the youth because they could be doing other things on here, but they decided to be yeah. doing this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you all again for coming out. Yeah. <laughs> we put together an advisory committee as we got closer that included our friends from the Clarice Center for the Performing Arts, Jane Hirschberg. Come on up, Jane. <laughs> and one of the, come on, one of our professors, quickly, quickly. <laughs> and just say who you are and where you're from and what popped for you. Um, so <laughs> this came across an email from the School of Public Health that they were looking for some people last year to help with a project to make a graphic novel, and they wanted a writer. And so I thought, oh, well, a writer, that's Jana, because Jana Schmidt was the director of the Jimenez Porter Writers House at the University of Maryland. And they, they have some incredibly talented students there, and Jana immediately recommended Marcus and Jasmine. And we had uh, one position. <laughs> She said, no, she said they have to be together. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you, that you all have this opportunity. And you're doing really amazing work. I mean, it very much is, um, it's, it's very relatable. It comes across. It's, I mean, it's real, right? It's real stories. So it's, it's very cool. Thank you. Yeah. So, 
you guys make it look so easy. <laughs> it's so hard. I mean, I'm just, the writing is so amazing on this. It's, it's got the details. It feels real. It feels like effortless the way that you put this together. Mm -hmm. And the art too, you just, you don't go too hard on things. It never gets like overly like melodramatic. It all feels very realistic and it, it pulls you in emotionally. It's just so effective. And the, the art, I'm just, so blown away because I didn't even know that you had that skill. And it's <laughs> yeah, all this art. So yes, it's beautiful. It gets more beautiful every time I see it. The details just keep on adding, and I'm, I'm just, I just love this project, and I'm so glad that you guys are doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you for getting us on. <laughs> Broadway bound. Broadway bound. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dan, can we hear from you? Yo, what's up, Zakia? Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Okay, Mika, Mika, you, you're next, please. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Zakia. I'm a friend of Marcus and Jasmine. Oh, man, I feel like this whole time I'm sitting here thinking about what everyone was saying. Um, so plus one to everything that everyone said. Um, I was trying to internalize it for myself. And I think it was so remarkable about this and someone I think said it already, that is super relatable, but I think you guys chose the right space and symbol to like to help tell this story. Because a barbershop is literally a community space where you air out everything from <laughs> pop culture to black history to your business, your family life, and different things like that. So mm -hmm. it's just super incredible that this is the, um, the point in time and kind of like the the community where you guys are sharing this story mm -hmm. because it's just it's the most invited space for this type of conversation so that part in itself just kind of blows me away um jasmine and marcus like you guys are extremely talented the art as someone said it gets better every time i see it so definitely um kudos Thank to you. you all there <laughs> but overall just really glad that there was this much engagement with the project i mean I don't know the last time I got to listen to a story and like see that much interaction and people like doing stuff like this, you know what I mean? So it definitely brings out the story and it makes everything in the novel pop even more with that uh, interactive element. Um, so yeah, you guys are doing a really good job. Um, I can't wait to see how this evolves and expands across the DMV and even beyond that. So. Um, good luck with everything, and uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. So I have a bit of a upper hand for a, a lot of this. I'm an artist, a nurse, and a wife of writer. So um, I get all Oh, <laughs> um, I worked throughout the entire pandemic. I helped when people came if they died. I had to explain to people the importance of the vaccine and making sure that you are protecting yourself and your family your loved um, and dealing with the disparities of just the African American community, the Hispanic community, everyone that's at a lower lower class and it's more difficult for them to get health care or for them to have insurance coverage to be able to have a family member in ICU or hospice. They're dying days and no one will be able to be with them. Yeah. Um, so seeing this is amazing. I've seen all aspects of each and every one of these people. It's like every single person in book one and two and I wait for the other four and two more. Yeah. yeah. Um, every single one of these people I've been able to encounter and see, and the fact that you were able to make it so well-rounded that everyone and anybody that read can understand it, that's the biggest thing in healthcare, is that you can make sure that somebody that is on a third grade reading level can look at it and say, I don't know what they're talking about. Right. You guys did that. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, Fred and Katrina, just come back one more time. And Dr. Cooper, 
quickly, quickly. Our, our pilot and stylist have also been trained in a certified community helper. Fred Fred Fry, our lead barber, Katrina. <laughs> And again, a mountain of administrative paperwork and help navigate them through that mountain of administrative paperwork is Dr. Cooper. So just say who you are and what pops for you and then, and then we'll let Fred talk. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Sharon Gibbs Cooper. I have had the privilege of working with not only Dr. T, but Fred, Mike, and Katrina and helping them to bridge those gaps, because we talk about disparity, mm -hmm. and we know the folks in the barbershops and the salons, they wear multiple hats. They're counselors, they're hair, they make it beautiful. <laughs> but they also guide us through different avenues in our lives and help us to navigate life and the healthcare system. <coughs> Excuse me. So it was just a pleasure to work with. What popped for me is we always hear about things being written in regards to the populations that we're serving. Here, this represents it through the lens of the community. We heard the voice of individuals, in the, the interpretation of what folks actually go through. Mm -hmm. And it was extracted from a real life setting, which allowed us to be able to view this and enlighten us and provide us with insight and there's more work to be done. Mm -hmm. So right. thank you so much. For using this platform to share this wonderful information and help to bridge those gaps yes. and educate others on how we can be innovative in coming up with solutions to bridge those disparities. Yes, yes. And build a culture of equity. Yes. So, our, our first job uh, where we launched the Cigna initiative was in Hyattsville. Uh, Mike Brown is on his anniversary, so mm -hmm. we're making him feel real bad he's not here, but real glad he's with his wife celebrating anniversary. So let's give a shout out to Mike Brown. Shout out to Mike. Shout out to Mike Brown. And thanks to shop owner. This Saturday we were just there. We screened 100 people in one day uh, for blood pressure screenings. It was an amazing day. Fred, what's popping for you, buddy? Fred, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, um, it's real, real on the front line. You know, we deal with people on a daily basis. Our community is in such a need of um, these type of programs and this type of help and support. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us, we just simply don't go to the doctor. We simply don't really know what we're dealing with. And sometimes we just feel hopeless, I feel. So us coming together with Dr. T and the program, helping the community to recognize how important health equity is, exactly what health equity is, and being able to push each other and help each other to say, listen, stay on top of your checkup. And what the doctor say, listen to him and go, don't self-diagnose yourself. And that's what we're here. We're just making these things take place and um, keeping everybody safe in our neighborhood. This is a big neighborhood. And our first initiative before COVID was colorectal cancer screening. If you can talk about a colonoscopy in a barbershop, you can talk about anything. Yeah. And that's how we started, uh, one, by one, one by one, in the chair. Yep. I just lost a good friend of mine who grew up with me, who was from colon cancer, and he got uh, diagnosed when we was running our thing, and I told you about it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it came back and it took him out. But it just has everyone aware, and that's what we need. Everybody aware that everyone wants to go out and try to do the right thing. And, even when it comes to vaccines and everything, we run so many, so many different initiatives in the shop that really help the community. And, I, and I'm looking at it, and I'm really, really, really thanking God. And one last thing. Thank you all for helping to reshape health care. And this is all part of that reimagining how we're going to deliver the health care in non-traditional uh, locations throughout the community because you're bringing health care to the community and instead of making the community coming to the bricks and mortar. So we talk about access. So this is the key to making that happen, bringing it to fruition. Okay. Yeah. Marcus Jackson. I mean, this is it. <laughs> I mean, you said it. The whole point of this project is engaging our community in a way. Um, uh, the whole point of this is to engage our community. Yeah, did go on. To engage our community um, in different mediums um, and 
reshape and reimagine what childcare can be. But I won't stop the feedback while it's coming. You got something to, to share? Yeah. This is great. Um, you engage the audience, um, as Marcus said in the beginning, and even in your um, in the books, we as black people, we don't talk about medicine or health, anything like that. My grandmother was 95 when she passed away, mm -hmm. but she did not go to the doctor. Mm -hmm. She said she had, her oldest child is 57 today, but she hadn't been to the doctors when, you know, since she had her last child, which was number 14. And so this is very, very encouraging and inspiring because we do not talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then when we do go to doctor's offices, we don't ask them to explain the, you know, the sickness or the disease or whatever in plain terms, in plain right. English, because right. we don't want to, we're afraid to get the diagnosis. We just put it under the rug and keep it moving. But this is very, very good. And the thing that um, caught my attention was the little girl who was being yeah. bullied yeah. because of the COVID monster. But this was very great, not only for adults, but also for children. Mm -hmm. And it'll give them, you know, open up their imagination. And they can be whatever they want to be. They can perceive whatever they want to perceive. Right. But even even in that, they can be writers and producers, mm -hmm. just as you're Marcus. And Marcus, yeah. I am so proud of you. Mm -hmm. I am <laughs> so proud of you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Like we say, uh, we are not coming to hold you long. We're strong, amen. So thank yeah. you for spending time with us tonight. And what we are going to do is we're going to have a reception with food catered by no other than DC Sweet Potatoes. DC Sweet Potatoes. Yes. Um, so they have tables set right outside the rehearsal hall. We'll also have, we have this photo wall. We have um, pages, select pages from each of the books that you can look at while you're munching on a salmon bowl. We have a salmon bowl out there. It's a vegetarian option. It's delicious. Um, so feel free to mingle and we're excited to just talk with you. Yeah, yeah. Can go, so that's um, the end of our Thank you. Yeah. Hang out. We want to get to know everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Can I give you a hug? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.